Welcome everybody to another episode of IGN Unfiltered. It is the monthly interview series where I am lucky enough to sit down with the best, brightest, most fascinating minds in the video game industry. And today, an extremely special guest from that game company, the co-founder, Genova Chen. Welcome. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you so much I'm for glad coming. Glad to be here. Yes, yeah. you are in the middle of uh, trying to put the finishing touches on Sky, your new <laughs> game for uh, Apple devices. We'll get to that later, but uh -huh. you know, we're here. I, I, you have had a very, very fascinating career, and I think one that is of interest to certainly anyone looking to get into games and see, well, what can that path look like? Uh, so I wanted to start, though, before we kind of get into that, uh, Genova Chen, that is, Genova is, uh, if you're a Final Fantasy fan, you may recognize mm -hmm. that name, and it turns out, so Genova is not your birth name, right. but uh, you in fact did adopt that uh, here f for, f as a name, and, and you did take it from Final Fantasy. Yes, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's kind of lame because uh, I got asked a lot from uh, Final Fantasy fans, you know, like, did your parents name you Genova? I'm like, no, I mean, my parents are Chinese, they don't name me English names. And the way we pick English name is in English class, uh, in high school, uh, the teacher would say, hey, you, you know, everyone should pick an English name for yourself, right? And uh, my best buddy, who was like my video game friend, yeah. picked Cloud, because we were like big Final Fantasy, Final Fantasy VII fans. And yeah. uh, I, I felt like I, I can't, you know, be behind Cloud. I have to pick a character that's better than Cloud. And uh, Sephiroth is just too difficult to spell and difficult to, to pronounce. Yeah. And I was trying to see out of the entire Final Fantasy VII, is there anyone who's better than Cloud? Uh, and so it turns out to be, you know, where Cloud and Sephiroth's cell is from, this Genova motherly character. But as I was reading the story and things, Genova actually doesn't have a gender. So it's gender neutral. Yeah. And I thought, yeah, this is absolutely way more badass than Cloud. So, <laughs> so I picked that name. But you know, that's my high school name. I didn't intend to keep that name as my legal name yeah. now. Uh, my Chinese name is uh, Xin Han, which means the Milky Way, which is a very interesting name. Yes. But after a whole semester uh, of study at the USC Film School, my writing class teacher Professor Gardner, like there's only six students in the class. He always have trouble calling my name. Like right? Xing Han is a difficult to pronounce name. And also it starts with X. So after a whole semester, he still look at me, could not say my name. I have to remind him what my name is. Eventually I figured I have to change to something simpler. But uh, my last name Chen is the most common name probably on earth. And if I just call myself Jason Chen, and I will have trouble finding emails, websites, and everything. Right, very right? So I'm like, I was Genova in high school, so why not Genova? You know. So a college professor couldn't handle couldn't yeah. handle your name. Yeah. So I mean, a grad school professor. Grad right? school professor. Oh my goodness. So so I figured that there must be some very difficult pronunciations going on with my first name. Well, it's yeah. stuck, and it's. Are, are you happy with it now? Well, I, I kind of like. I didn't plan it, but you know, isn't Genova the creature coming from the you know the the galaxy? You know, which is kind of like my first name anyway in Chinese. So like serendipitous, so it works yeah. out. Um, so you and I are almost exactly the same age. We're about a year apart. But mm -hmm. having grown up in China, so you know, in the West, I confess, I I don't know a lot about. Gaming in China, I you know I've heard about there was a, a console ban for many mm -hmm. years, but then it, but clearly you and your friend in high school were were very uh, interested in Final Fantasy. So what was it like? Was was it easy to to be a gamer as a kid in China or, or how was uh, yeah, it? Yeah, console ban happened after Sega Genesis. Okay. So before that, we were all into console. It's so expensive we couldn't afford it. So whoever in the in class have a Sega Genesis, we'll be like, always wanted to go to his home. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that's the time when we started to read these console-based magazines. So even after console was banned, the magazine was not. So a lot of the games, uh, we didn't get to play it. We just get to read the entire walkthrough. So right. what happened in China is because so many people can't buy these games anymore, 
the the game editor would write review in first person, hmm. and uh, sometimes in the role of the character. So most of the Final Fantasy I exp I experienced all you know was through this editor's eye. You know? So you read Final Fantasy yeah. more so than yeah. you played it. That's very interesting. Yeah, and uh, the, eventually when Final Fantasy VII, so I first read Final Fantasy, and then once it's finally coming to PC, which because PC is not banned, right. I could actually buy the game and play it. How did, yeah. uh, and how did playing it compare to reading it? Did it sort of live up to what you'd, what you'd created in the, your mind? The, the reading is better. I mean, also my English sucks. Right, so when I played the English PC version, you know, I, w I wasn't able to understand every single word. And, uh, but when I was reading the Chinese, it was from a passionate gamer who put himself in the role. I mean, there's right. poetry involved. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's probably the imagination was better. <laughs> hmm. uh, so when you were a kid, did you, did you want to make games when you grew up? What, what did you want to be when you were a kid? Uh, so I started learning programming when I was seven, which is kind of early in, in terms of Chinese kids in that generation. It's probably here in America, you guys probably started learning pro programming or computers around that time. Uh, so we have to go to this special school to, to study programming. I mean, certainly not my choice. But initially I hated it, but once I arrived to class early, before the teacher arrived, every single kid is playing some kind of game. Right. And then we're like, oh, I can play games here. <laughs> Dad, let's go to the class early. You know? Yeah, like, when I was a kid, it was yeah. in the computer lab. It was uh, SimCity, if we were lucky, but a lot of times. Oregon uh, Trail was a Oregon common Trail, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We would play Oregon <laughs> Trail, too. Uh, and uh, so I wasn't a good student in the class to study programming, but I was a good student playing games, and uh, you know, all the students' interest is playing games, and so we wanted to make games. But back then, uh, this is before Microsoft Paint. Right. Uh, all the games are mostly just lines and dots, right, and text. Uh, so for one summer, all of us in the class, we wanted to make a aerial combat game. Um, oh, sorry, uh, we were trying to make a strategy game. Mm -hmm where I spent like an entire summer coding at home, wow. doing really stupid things, you know, because you have, we want to draw the entire map of China and we want to conquest on the map, yeah. but there was no drawing software. So the only way to draw the map is to use coordinates. Wow. Draw lines, right? And I did that. I was so proud I was going to take it to the class to show my, show my students. And you know, back then, floppy disks, the, the five, five inch and floppy quarter, disk yeah. and the three inch floppy disk, every now and then they got a dust or they got scratched and the whole thing has to be reformatted, right? Yes. And I don't have the money for a backup disk. Oh no. <laughs> so, so that ended my early career of game making, you know, while I was in elementary school. But afterwards, uh, China was very heavy in terms of academics. I had no time to do anything but study until I'm in college. So back, once I'm in college again, I'm like, yeah, in, in America, it's like, it's easy to get into college. It's hard to graduate. In China, it's the reverse. Huh. Uh, once you're in college, nobody cares because you, you're in, you know, like the fact you're in right. proves that you're smart and you are good at academics. And afterwards, nobody cares. Hmm. Uh, so I kind of just, you know, I, I kind of, being this bad student in college, well, my major was computer science, but I, I rarely go to the class. So most of the time I was hanging out in the art school, learning drawing, because that's the thing I really want to learn, but my dad doesn't want me to learn. Yeah, that's, I mean, well, yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to get to yeah. to college. So were your, were your parents, so with the time you were spending mm -hmm. with the computer and on this, this sort of programming uh, uh, project for, over the summer. Were your parents supportive of the time you spent on the computer or were they, did, because I know a, a, of our age, a lot mm. of parents were not quite sure about these computer things. Oh, yet. my dad is not the case because he was one of the first generation get touched onto these computers. I mean, the computer like the size of this room. Yeah. And he kind of like found his niche, you know, through Cultural Revolution, my dad was kind of like a, you know, elite graduate master student from the best university being so being flipped down 
to be a plumber, uh, to work in factories. Like, because during that time, any intellectuals is not supposed to be respected, right? right? So he's working as a plumber in a shipyard, and until one day the shipyard say, "Hey, we have all these big machine we imported from you know uh, overseas, but we have no way to know how to operate this thing." So they were like, oh, "Who is smart among the young kids?" They grab my dad, and so my dad's career kind of rises up from wow. the computer thing, and uh, so he believed the future is computer, right? So he's like. Bought me the computer way earlier than other kids. That's forced great. me to study programming, even though my passion is art, right? So I was always kind of uh, fighting against my dad's will, basically. <laughs> uh, like a lot of sons, I guess, yeah. uh, that happens to you. So, uh, but you became so proficient in programming uh, that you sort of alluded to this, that it, it became sort of too, too easy at... Uh, at Shanghai Zhao Tong University, so uh, so you you just you dove into art and animation instead and kind of ignored the the computer <laughs> science side. Yeah, because because I started way earlier than other people. It's not yeah. like I'm better or smarter. I just kind of started five six years ahead of everyone else, and so by the time we started the computer science in college, I realized some of my classmates have never used a mouse before. Wow, and. Yeah, and, and so I thought, well, I guess I can still pass the class. Why not? <laughs> Why not just to do something else? Well, I certainly spent a lot of time in esports. Back then, we don't have esports, but we have tournaments of StarCraft right. and Red Alert and all these things. Um, but yeah, I always wanted to make art because before I, I think around the age of 11 to 13, uh, that's around the time your frontal cortex, the brain cell, is just very new. And so a lot of the strong memory or uh, trauma uh, happened to be around that uh, age. And uh, that's the time where I was really uh, moved by some of the movies, uh, animations, you know, and games. And I just think, well, I, something could touch me and put me out of words for days, and I will wake up the second day crying about what I saw the day before. And uh, a good movie will make me think about what did I just see? What, 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 it was, what, what, what was that? Why was I moved so much? And I have to kind of come to terms with these great art pieces. Like, what did I just learn from there? Like, my body told me, I have digested something really great, but my brain hasn't followed up. I would spend days to think about, yeah. you know, what did I learn? You know, a good game would make me think. I mean, Final Fantasy VII would make me think. And so I often find that after I come to terms of what I just digested, I become a better person. And partly because of the act of the character in the story or part of the the act I have chosen in the games, then I just felt like the, the, the art piece made me a better person. What could be cooler to do if you can make something and then you can make other people better? So what, you know? what, when you immersed yourself in art uh, and animation, what, what kind of art was it? Were you making computer art? Were you, ma were you painting? Were you, what, what sort uh, of art? It was, I mean, I do do that all the time when I was a kid, but I, w I know I wasn't as good as the systematically trained uh, students. And just like playing piano, you can't catch up if you didn't start young. And so over the course of the four year in college, I realized I'm actually better at digital art because I already know computer inside out. I can write tools and scripts that the art student have no clue about. And so I can pick up all the tools, you know, 3ds Max, Maya, right. ZBrush, you know, all the all the tools. So, and then at that point, I realized, oh, actually, I'm 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 better at combining, you know, technology and art to make things. So, so for me at the time, it was very obvious. Like, what I should do is to come to America, get a degree, and join Pixar. It's your superpower. Yeah, you found and, your superpower. And hopefully one day I can be a director to make something that touches people. 
So um, yeah, you, you came to USC, the University of Southern California, and you ended up, you earned a master's degree from their interactive media division. Mm -hmm. Now the Princeton Review, I learned, has named USC's interactive media division the number one game design program in the United States for almost every year since Until it opened. Until recently. Unt uh, since 2002 yeah, when it opened, yeah. uh, which would have been, you, you probably uh, went uh, not too long after that. Mm -hmm. uh, so <clears throat> making games hasn't been something, uh, historically speaking, that, that one could study, mm -hmm. particularly at, at a postgraduate level. So um, for, for people that want to get into game design, I mean, do you, do you recommend the, this program mm -hmm. for, for people who are interested in game design? It, it, it's interesting. This, uh, this, this is a subject I was really kind of in the middle of uh, seven years ago. Because uh, like you said, uh, when I joined the program, we only had six students ahead of me. It was a brand new program, interactive media. There's no games. Yeah. Games was added later into the division. Uh, when I joined the program, nobody was working on games, right? And uh, people are working on mobile apps, internet apps, uh, theme park applications. And it was that year, uh, USC wanted to bring more uh, sponsorship. And uh, one of the person who visited was Don Matrick from EA. Yep. And so, the school was saying like, hey, any of you guys made any games? We want to kind of gather together all the portfolio to show EA, hey, we can make games. Uh, and I said, hey, I, I made three games while I was in college. So, you know, and also it was the year where uh, I, you know, I was trying to look for jobs to, to support myself because I don't have money to pay the tuitions for the, the graduation program. So yeah. I have to figure out a way to make money to pay tuition. And uh, one of the students uh, in, the, in the following year, and I was at GDC, we were like looking at all the games at the IGF. And we're like, these are the games that the, the people in our age are making, they suck. <laughs> yeah, the, it was the Independent <laughs> Games Festival. Yeah, and we were like, I, I thought everybody's like John Carmack here. You know, because when we make gaming in China, there's nobody to learn. The only people who can learn is from overseas reading articles from American game industry. And right. we just assume everybody's so advanced. And, uh, but once I was here, I was like, yeah, the game I made was better than this. And so we went to pitch to the school. We say, hey, can, you, can the school pay us over the summer? So we stay in school, we work every day, we make games and uh, we could get our games into these uh, competition and win, win awards so that the school will get publicity. Because right. Right? school is also trying Smart. to uh, appeal to gaming students. Sure, gain notoriety. Yeah, because they just started in two years. There's, no, there's, there's only one teacher, uh, two teachers in, in our school that had gaming background, right? And <laughs> so, so how can we attract more students, right? So we're like, you pay us, we make games, we win awards, and we can attract more students. So the school paid us over the summer, and so we made, over two months, we made an engine, we made a game. And so Don Matrix saw the game, and it was actually kind of cool. It's like two... Cloud, right? No, it was called Dieting. Oh, okay, different thing. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, it was a game where it's a two-player co-op, except the two player can't see the world of each other, like there's a parallel universe. So you can only see your world and he can only see his world. Mm -hmm. We're just trying to make uh, innovative co-op mechanics. Uh, but it's innovative enough. I guess EA was like eventually donating $8 million to the school. And uh, from that point on, there is a game track. Uh, and then the school had say, hey, you know, this, these kids, like we're paying them minimal wages. They got us a lot of att attractions. We should continue with this program. So they started a grant called Gaming Innovation Grant, uh, and they opened it up to the entire school for anyone to pitch game ideas, and they were, the winner will got $20,000 to build a team and to build a game, and that is cloud. So how, if, if this is, I think that's brilliant. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you leverage, basically you had a bit of leverage in the sense that you had this game design talent that it was exactly what the school needed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
How I didn't. Yeah, I didn't come to the school to be a game designer. I come here for the cinema school to study animations. Right. But yeah. it so worked out. Like how, how now? If you got them help get them an eight million dollar grant from EA, I wouldn't say that's all my credits, but you know that well, was part of it. How yeah. have they not named the program after you at this point? I mean, you're, that's it should be the Genova Chen School of Game Design. <laughs> Maybe if I donate, you know, eighty six million like George Lucas. Right? <laughs> well, that's another yeah. story, I guess. But um, on that note, though, would would you ever uh, want to go and teach? Game, game design or art there, uh, either, either you know, during your game design career or maybe if you decide to after your, your design career? Uh, I mean, I've been giving talks. I've been giving lots of talks. Uh, I think to me, teaching, the most effective teaching is uh, giving talks. And, but if you actually go to a class and there's only 12 students in your class, teach a whole semester, I actually felt, you know, in, in the end, our, our time is limited. And I have a mission, and my mission is to help grow the industry. And would it be better suited, I focus on 12 young minds, or is it better if I can make a game that could have millions of people who have played it and be inspired, right? Because in the end, learning, I didn't learn from a teacher who is really good at teaching game design. Right. I just wanted to make games, so I have to scroll the libraries and the internet to find everything I needed. I only need a TA, which when I have troubles, I, when I lost direction, I can ask them once or twice. Yeah. But I don't need someone to tutor me for learning how to make games. Right? So in the end, I think it's more important to inspire than to you know, like hold them accountable for classes and assignments. Yeah. So uh, at USC, you met Kelly Santiago, mm -hmm. whom you later co-founded that game company with. So I'm curious, what, what has she meant to your career? You know, what, what can you tell me about when, when you met her and what made you want to go into business together? I think she has changed my view on the game industry a lot because she's a strong, you know, woman. And uh, well, I mean, part of the reason I choose her to start a business is really because all the other people are so unaccountable. <laughs> if you work on a project in school, I remember when I started Flow Project after Cloud, I had 15 people showed up on day one. And after that weekend, only one person would still come to the project, right? And uh, when we work on Cloud, there were students who participated, take all the money, but never worked on anything. There were students who were supposed to manage money who actually stole money from the project. Right? Kelly was one I brought in, you know, in the middle, I mean, she's my classmate. I brought her in as a producer to manage the team, essentially. Yeah. And she actually did the work. You know, we, we, we worked through everything, like we manually put the disc into the, you know, like we burn the disc, put the cover, and we tie it with, with all the care and everything. We just did everything. So personally, I felt like, you know, this is the only person I would trust, you know, if I work with someone who's going to stay, <laughs> who's yeah. actually going to do the work. Uh, and the other thing is, I have no idea how to start a business. I don't even think I could start a business as a student on F1 visa. So when we finished the cloud project. Um, it's also because of cloud, uh, we had so many people writing email to me. Um, I mean, that's a first time experience. Like you make a work and you got people from Japan, Australia, Feedback. yeah, London, they write email to tell you, please tell everybody who's involved in this project that they're beautiful people. I was like, my parents never told me I'm a beautiful person ever in my life, right? And why does these strangers around the world tell me that we're beautiful people? And uh, I think it has a lot to do with the game. So Kelly and I both experienced that, and we both believe there's value in making a game that is not just violent you know, sports. And so, yeah, it, that's how we started. Uh, you know, essentially, so many people writing emails saying, you should, you should consider starting a business to make these game commercial 
so more people can know that games are not about just violence and competitions. And that, that was literally the, 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 the fan feedback that pushed us to, you know, be brave enough to say, hey, you know, we're, we, we know nothing about game development. We are students. We have no professional experience. But we are going to ask people to give us money to start a company. And so we started TGC before we even graduate from school. So yeah. that, that's the lesson is put in, don't slag off in college. If you're going <laughs> to do the work, put in the work, and you can end up co-founding a game company that goes on to make a bunch of wonderful things and you can have a great career. I, I'll bet those people that, that uh, stole the money or, or, didn't sh or stopped showing up, I'll bet they're not doing anything now. <laughs> but they're doing nothing of note now. Well, they, they <laughs> did end up joining the game industry, believe me or not. I think uh, the game had a, quite a good boom uh, you know, in the past 15 years. I mean, then recently there's a different type, kind of boom. Um, so cloud. Uh, cloud, you've mentioned a couple times. It was, uh, it was about a young hospital patient who... who uh, soars in his mind despite mm -hmm. being trapped trapped mm -hmm. indoors and um, did you you had to you did win a grant to, to mm -hmm. help fund that do you remember the projects that you were up against for that grant and did, <laughs> and, and did you know that you would win I, I honestly don't but given the fact we just finished dieting and we were in the IGF just the, the next year I seriously doubt there was a second team in the school who can compete with us but to give you a different story, yeah. uh, Cloud had a, a, a different competition that's out of my own mind. So for a very long time, this project was inspired by the, the beautiful clouds in the sky. Uh, but I wasn't able to come up anything worthy that's interesting. So I thought, oh, can we do something like SimCity where we can manipulate the clouds and creating the weather? But what, what am I supposed to do with the weather? Aha, disasters, right? Like SimCity, you can right. destroy your city. And uh, I was pitching this concept to my professor, Tracy Fullerton. I was, I was saying like, hey, maybe this is a game about an alien race coming from Jupiter, or a gas planet. They have the technology to manipulate any kind of you know, atmosphere, and they're here to causing hazards on Earth. And uh, that's, the, that's the original pitch I have. And... Uh, yeah, I think my life has changed just because my professor's one suggestion. She said, you know, why don't you change this main character from an alien conqueror to a child? You know, like, what would that game be? Yeah. And she just said, you should channel your own childhood, right? And, and, and which is what I followed her instruction. I, you know, when I was a child, I was sick a lot. I had asthma, you know. Back then, we don't know there's air pollution in China. We just right. thought that's fog, right? So I spent a lot of time, every year around my birthday, I would be coughing. I couldn't even lie down to sleep. And there was no, med you know, there's no inhalers in China right. back then. So I have to suffer. I, I so, have asthma too, so I can relate. Yeah. So every year, I would just be going to hospitals, and just waiting. And I would look out the window, I would see the sun, I would see the leaves wave, I would just daydream. And so it's kind of like I'm channeling my own sadness, I guess, yeah. and loneliness into the game, but to actually be free. I mean, the game allows me to be free, you know, to fly out, to, you know, and that's why in the game, you know, you, you fly into this, uh, this beautiful place and you can use the cloud to create uh, rain and the rain can clean the land and the city I and mean, that's basically and the air yeah the air I mean I did I didn't really think through this but it was just natural and it comes out of me um, and when people play they cry and I I didn't know why People cry. Honestly, I've been working on that for supposedly I'm supposed to finish that in a semester, which is six months. Uh, we worked over the summer, uh, nine months, and then the money runs out. I have to put my own time, extra three months into the game. 
Um, so at, by then, it's almost a year. I just, you know, if you look at the same thing every day, you don't feel anything. But people cried the game, and they were like, you know, <laughs> back in 2005, people were still saying, can video game even make people cry? Right. Was, that was like the most, you know, challenging subject. By now, it's, it's not a question, right? Um, but I would n have never thought about combining my personal expression and emotion with a game. Because before that, it, game is always about simulations, you know, like simulating sports, simulating war, simulating economy, right? And so the fact people cry, that the people tell us we need to do more of this is kind of like what drives me to abandon my Pixar dream to like, maybe I should do more on this medium. You right, know? and that's what, that's, what make games, that's what makes games art though, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Is when it can connect with someone on yeah, that kind of level. Yeah. And, and, and then I was hooked, you know, it's like, if you make a piece of art and people respond, you feel that you're not alone, right? You can be understood, even though maybe in real life you don't. Uh, so then I made flow and I made a uh, flower and flower got even more letters of people telling me how they were moved and how the game made their life better. And, and I think Flower is the first time I think like, ooh, I actually achieved my childhood dream is, hey, there's a game that can make people's life better. Yeah, um, we'll, get to, we'll get to that. Yeah. Uh, but before, I, before we move off of Cloud, I have to ask, because we'll talk about Sky too, that's your new mm -hmm. game uh, that's, that's on its way. But Cloud and now to Sky, <laughs> is there any coincidence there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I can say people will say, oh, um, Sky is a combination of Cloud, Journey, Flow, Flower. And it is seriously kind of, you know, when we uh, started our contract with Sony, uh, we wanted to pitch for Cloud, but we were naive enough to ask for $10 million to make that game. And if I was anywhere uh, aware of business or, or you know, <laughs> budget, that's just laughable. And so John Hyde at the time, who was the uh, head of Sony External Publishing, decided to take us, even though we were asking ridiculous numbers. And yeah. he just said, why don't you just make your flow game first? You know, like prove that you can make a real commercial game before we can move to cloud. So we signed this three game contract with Sony where all the IP will be owned by Sony. Yeah. And now, then when we were making Journey, I was thinking, well, should I make Cloud? But then the Cloud will be owned by Sony. And it was really something that I made at school. It should be my own IP, That's right? right? And so after the Sony deal, we were like, we, you know, back in 2005, people were telling us to make this game into a commercial game. I still haven't delivered. And I wanted to make Cloud the commercial game. Uh, but then all these regulations are changing. Um, what happens is in the gaming school, so many students are making game during school. Many schools start to realize the school they should own, own the IP. Yeah. <laughs> so after that, we were like, hey, is, is USC okay if we make cloud too? Uh, and there was complication there. I, I was just thinking, man, I mean, it's not like I'm trying to remake the same thing again. Right. After Journey and Flower and Flow, I've learned so much that I felt it's no longer really just a cloud anymore. It's a combination of everything I wanted to, I thought was great to get and to put them together. And uh, so that's why we call it Sky, because it's bigger than the cloud. And was, yeah. was Flow part of your master's thesis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that had to go. That probably went over very well, I, I imagine. <laughs> uh, so yeah, after cloud, uh, cloud was made on my uh, during the second year and third year of my master program, and Tracy was saying you should just finish your thesis using cloud. You know, like write a business pitch of that. That's your thesis. But what happened is, uh, out of the letters of people's love and you know thankful letters, there are equal amount of people who said, I heard about this game from my friend, I never played games, but I want to try our game, but I really don't know how to play our game, right? Like I said, well, haven't you played World of Warcraft? Use the right mouse button to rotate the camera, right? 
but these people never played any games. Yeah. And they they were they suffered in this experience. If you ever do a play test, you watch the non game of playing your game, it's like a torture. Um, and I was really kind of torn because I felt like I've for the for the many people who loved the experience, I've also ruined many people's first attempt to a video game, and they it turned them away. I mean, it 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 draw their interest because. It's something different. It's not about fighting or killing, and they are suddenly interested in flying in the clouds. But the game was so poorly made that their first experience with video game would end their future interest in video games. And I love games, but not everybody loves games, right? And I want to have more people to love this medium. Sky being on iPhone is starting to make <laughs> a lot of sense to me right now. Right, and, and so. I told my professor, I was like, I got to figure out a way to redesign, to design a game so that even non-gamer, if they just come in the first time, they can still enjoy the game at a very different pace as a hardcore gamer. Uh, and so that's why I, I spent three months working on Flow. Uh, and I looked into the psychology called Flow Theory, which is about you know, how different people can enjoy an activity at a very different pace, as long as the difficulty matches with, with their ability growth, right? I mean, it's a very simple idea, and I want to see if I can make our game accessible to these people who showed interest in games. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I was fixated on that concept, so my professor was not able to change my thesis, uh, but then when I worked on it, I wrote all these, you know, theory about how you can dynamically difficult, change the difficulty of the game. But my professor was like, yeah, it's all great theory. I, I think it will work, but you need data to back it up. You know, you need to show real research and numbers to, to, to prove your theory. And I was thinking, how can I get the maximum amount of play tester, which I can't afford yeah. to play a game? So I thought I have to make it on a browser so there's no install required, there's no download. Um, and so Flow had like six million people playing it. It's, it's kind of like crazy considering I only spent three months learning Flash to make this game on the browser. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, when <laughs> it was downloaded 650,000 times uh, in, in, within in the first four months alone, uh -huh. um, are you, are you like a rock star on, on campus? Are you Mr. Popular at that point? Uh, I don't think so. I no? Think back then, I'm only popular among game creators. I think what happened is after Flow was out, I got a, basically a, a employment letter from Will Wright. You know, Maxis is mm -hmm. like, hey, we want to hire you because it looked like the first stage of Spore. Right. Uh, yeah, that, that kind of kicked up my career. Uh, but it also, the funny thing is, uh, John Hyde from Sony was a huge aquatic collector. So he collected all kinds of fishes and huh. sea, sea creatures. I have no idea, by the way, when I was talking to him. I was like, you know, Sony was like one of the last publishers I talked to. And everybody else was kind of, you know, that looks great, but our gamers don't even play. You know, actually, I talked to Steam. Steam was like, this is a cool game, but our player only plays shooters, you know? So come back when you have a shooter. Uh, but th this is Steam back in 2005. Yeah. Later they opened to indie games, right? But this is really early. Uh, and John Hyde saw Flow, because I, I was like, oh, by the way, I just made this Flow game. It was getting a lot of traction. Maybe you can take a look at that. I was just kind of like, after my cloud pitch, this is like, oh, you should try this. <laughs> And he played Flow, and he was like, this is actually a pretty good game. And later on, I realized he's really into sea creatures. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Um, so you had apparently, you intended to return to China after completing mm -hmm. your master's degree at USC. Uh, do you ever think about how your life may have been different if you had done that? Uh, for... 10 years, for the past 10 years, I would have thought if I go back to China, it would be a much worse life, right? I mean, it's, you're going to work on one of those Me Too games in a big game company. But uh, given what has happened in the past five years in China, I'm like, if, 
I have been back in China. I might be one of these people who made a game for, you know, like <laughs> a billion people. Right. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. I I I, I do wonder sometimes because uh, China right now is one of the largest game market. Yeah, the yeah. console bans over, and there there's. I mean, the the biggest game, uh, I believe, in China. It's if I remember it correctly, it's called Act, Act of Valor, I believe. Or, no, it's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, they made yeah. different name there, I think. It's but, League of Legends clone. Right. It but it just came here, and no, yeah. like, we were talking about it here. We have we have no idea until it was sort of pitched to us, and yeah. that it was that it was it's something like a hundred million concurrent players yes. yeah. in China, which is That's unfathomable a, to yeah. our audience. They made eight billion dollar last year, like more than any <laughs> console game company ever made, just wow. on a, a mobile game. You know, so it it is kind of, you know, I, I, in a way it's weird. Like my my hope is always to make other people <laughs> love games, but. In a strange way, China somehow managed to get everybody into playing games, like way earlier than the Western market. Yeah. Uh, um, so you did, as you mentioned, you you did hear from Will Wright and Maxis, and you did work on Spore mm -hmm. for a little while. What did you learn from Will Wright and from that experience? I, so I think the, the the real thing I learned from Will that I often use was to think how to invent new genres. Uh, we'll always talk about like video game genre like different colonies. When you come to America, right, you don't know this is a big pie. You have no idea where could potentially be a little town or city. So a lot of people go out and die, right? And they didn't hit anything. Yeah. Uh, but then someone found you know, New York, and someone found like Philadelphia, right? And then between the two cities, people were like, oh, is there anything in between? Because they travel between a lot, and then they find some other cities. Right. But very rarely people go outside the safe zone to find a new genre, which I think Will did. He invented Sims, right? Yes. Sims is by far the most social single player game. And Sims essentially is the most successful PC game of all time, and over 93% are women who play it, right? I mean, if you look at it from an emotional perspective, like male and female have different emotional needs. And, and it, it's no brainer to look at why would women be interested in Sims, right? <laughs> it's a dollhouse simulation, but it really gives them the feeling of family relationship dynamics and, and housekeeping, really. And, uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, but I also learned something to not to do like mm -hmm. well. When we were working on sport, I was really hoping I could learn from him every day. Uh, but I think over nine months, I've only talked to Will three times. Big team, right? Uh, it's a big team, but also I think he was going through a lot. Uh, I think he often went to Russia. Hmm. Uh, at the time I heard he was buying rockets. <laughs> but anyway, but the key is I think he wasn't quite there as often as I would hoped that, you know, in the end, I would, there's so many designers on the team. Like, I felt like if he was there more, we would be more coherent. And right. I think that was the, the main disappointment about Spore is it felt like multiple games together but not like one single mind right mm -hmm. so you 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 did work at Maxis though after you founded that game company uh, -huh. uh so did you what was sort of your motivation then if you had your company that you'd started but you went to for a little while to work at Maxis mm -hmm. were you wanting to see what it was like at a big studio for a big publisher and see that side of it or or what what was sort of your your uh, uh, motivation it's, there it's uh, it's mostly just immigration status because i can't uh, stay in america if i don't have a job right and uh, i can't sponsor myself from my own company if my company doesn't have a business revenue and uh, at the end of uh, summer, um, we are still in negotiation with Sony about this three-game deal. Mm -hmm. So there's really no income, and you can't sponsor yourself. So I, I, I took the kind of, you know, 
uh, an alternative path. I said, hey, Kelly, and uh, you know, maybe you and Nick, who worked on Flow with me in, in grad school, can port the game first. I, I just need to get my visa first yeah. before I could stay. So I, that's kind of like, and also, you know, we don't know if the Sony deal is really going to pan out. True. Right? So I took the job, and then halfway through that job, the Sony deal went through. Uh, and, you know, eventually Flow was ported without me being involved because, you know, I can't work on two companies at the same time legally. Yeah. Uh, but after Flow was shipped, the company needed a new project. And that's kind of why I returned to TGC you know, start working on Flower. Yeah, and so <clears throat> Flower seemed like very almost deliberate counter-programming to the very dark mm -hmm. action games uh, of, of the time. Is that fair to say? Flower is, uh, yeah, I would say it's more like a, a, a lesser version of Cloud. Uh, you know, Cloud was, I mean, nobody would write letters to tell me Flo was, uh, you know, you're a beautiful person making Flo, <laughs> right? Flo is a very much of a academic practice on making a game that allows casual gamer, non-gamer, and hardcore gamer to get in the game and get, you know, kind of into the zoom as quick as possible. But it's not an emotional expression. Right. Uh, and so I, would, I wanted to do an emotional expression piece but since it's the first time I'm working on a real commercial game, I, I, I can't make a game as big as, you know, involving characters because our engine doesn't even have animation features. The entire flower game, we don't have animations because <laughs> it was written from scratch. Uh, so, so we, yeah, we worked on something much simpler and much more abstract. So uh, then, uh, then Journey, after, mm -hmm. after Flower, and I don't know if you're a Bruce Springsteen fan, but mm -hmm. uh, I would say, if, is Journey your born to run? Is that <laughs> is Journey your sort of seminal masterpiece to uh, date, do you think? Yeah, I actually think about this subject a lot because I've seen many great directors making their masterpiece when they were young, but they were never able to top it afterwards. Yeah. I mean, if, if you look at Godfather, you know, if you look at you know, even Stanley Kubrick, you know, like, I wouldn't say his last movie is my favorite, right? And uh, No love for Eyes Wide Shut. <laughs> <laughs> I watched it when I was really young, so. Um, but, but yeah, it, it has been a, a humongous pressure. Uh, I mean, every day I would go to the office looking at the two Guinness records on my, you know, on the, on the award trophy table, it's like, the most award winning for an indie game. I was just like, there's no way I can do a game that's you know, on par with Journey. Even if it's on par, people will still be disappointed, right? And I, I just felt like I'm, I'm on a quest to fail if I try to even compete with myself. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'd be curious like how, what will happen with people playing Sky you know, today? Yeah. You know, on the beta. Um. How do you feel about Journey in hindsight when you look back on it? Is it mm -hmm. uh, do you have any regrets with that game or, or things that you wish you had done differently? Uh, I think the, the management and the process of Journey's making was terrible. Uh, that's also partially because I have no idea how to manage. You know, I'm a game creator. I'm not a... MBA students, you know, right. it's the studio. One thing I noticed is game developers tend to be mentally more uh, youthful or immature than, uh, you know, other, other industries. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's partially because we need to be creative. We need to sure. think outside the box. But, you know, if you work in a game studio, you will realize there's all kinds of personalities, right? Um, and, uh, because of that, there was a lot of fighting. Uh, there was a lot of uh, stuff going on in the studio that, you know, it caused, you know, a lot of damage between people's relationship. Um, but 
in a way, if we would have managed this very well back then, and uh, everything went smoothly, I wouldn't think Journey would be equally powerful. Because you know, like a game really reflects the people who are making it. Absolutely. The the struggle we went through in the last year of Journey was pretty insane, and I think that is also why. When I was working on the struggle level, I was able to channel my own struggle into the game. I remember I was tweaking how far can the player walk in the snow mountain. Was it thirty seconds? Was it two minutes? Yeah. Was it five minutes before you really fall? And I was just walking on that. I think it was two a.m. I was alone in the office, and you know. <laughs> The company is about to run out of money. People are talking about quitting. People are talking about disassembling the company, and I still worry about whether I have cancer or not. Because at the time there was some medical complication, and I was just kind of crying while I was while I was making and testing the game myself. I was yeah. like, I'm I'm pushing forward, <laughs> and yeah, I, I think if. It wasn't for the difficulty of the the project. I probably won't have the inspiration of making the final scene of Journey. Well, it's not the final scene; it's the the scene before the climax. Yeah.、Uh, but I was crying at my own game. I was while I was making it. I, this never happened before. Right,、know? because like you've said, you've lived with it every single day for、mm-hmm. such a long time. Yeah, everybody's so. I mean, before we shipped the game, we were all skeptical about: Is this even a good game? Right, because we are just really detached.、Um, Do you br- are you a person who brings in focus testers? Are you into that, or are you just yeah? You, you the like- focus testers always say, "Oh, where's the gun? Oh, you know, there's not enough. There's no enemies here, right?"、Uh, yeah, I mean, even flower and journey. Most of the time, the focus testers don't dig it until everything is really together. Yeah, yeah.、Uh, the so for me, journey is an allegory of life itself.、Mm-hmm. What 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 is, what does the ending of Journey mean to you? I, I I feel like I've gotten a little bit of it after that last that last anecdote you just told, but I'm I'm curious to hear now, <laughs> these years later, what what does the ending of it mean to you? Uh, I think when I try to make the game, I understand the game theoretically, because、uh, I learn I study in the film school, we learn how to tell a powerful story, and it's, in order to touch someone. You have to create a cathartic, emotional surprise. Really, a surprise. You know, like you won't scare somebody if you don't build up the the anticipation. Yeah. And then suddenly there's a there's a turn. We say, you know, if you boil a frog in the water, he doesn't even know, right? It the the film is about the opposite. It's like you want to make people think the things are going one way, and then you twist it. At the end, if it's a positive twist, it's、uh, it's you know a Christmas story. Yeah. If it's a negative twist, it's a tragedy, right? And、uh, but it's all about having that strong emotional shakeup, and that's also tied to what I told you earlier. Was a kid, I was left speechless after watching something. Why am I speech speechless? It's because catharsis. And catharsis was a Greek theater term before it was a medical term,、mm-hmm. and it's about flushing your organs with so much water that afterwards your organ has a weird emptiness,、mm-hmm. and it it creates a, a cleansing and healing process. And I think somehow an emotional catharsis made me feel I'm becoming better,、uh, and I mean. When I was younger, I have no idea. But after I study, you know, film and cinema and writing, you know, systematically, I understand this is actually how you do it. And in Hollywood, the most advanced structure is the three act structure. The most popular story structure was the hero's journey from Joseph Campbell.、Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with the hero's journey, but these two structure was like. The golden rule: nobody right, is supposed to go go out of the box.、Um, but I also happen to find a structure of life from Confucius thinking. You know, like in Chinese, we say when you're thirty, you're entering a phase called 
there's no doubt. Uh, when you enter uh, 40, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, 30 is, is not, sorry, 30 was you can stand on your own, right? You don't rely on anyone. And when you're in 40, you have no doubts about the world. And when you're 50, you understand the pattern of heaven and earth. That's like how you describe the different stage of life. And I was lining up this, this different stage of life against the, the hero's journey, against the three-act structure. I was like, whoa, this is, life is the perfect three-act story. <laughs> you know, and uh, the reason we choose to tell that story was because I want to create a game that is actually social. And because 2012, or sorry, 2009, when we shipped Flower, people would like Farmville, social game is for the future. Right. But I was like, there's no social feeling here. I'm managing a farm. How is this a social game? Besides my friend can see my farm. <laughs> and I was like, I want to show people what is social. And it is an emotional exchange of people and an emotional bond between people. And people, you know, like, as I was doing research, you know, like people do company trust building exercise by putting employees through some ordeals, right? And then <laughs> afterwards they will have a bond. And so I thought, how can I bond two people to its maximum? You know, you kind of have to go all the way, right? So what is the ordeal? And I thought, well, the biggest ordeal of everything is not an epic adventure. It is life. Yeah. So how can I walk through birth to death with two person? And I think they would bond afterwards. I mean, that's kind of like when we start a project, you know, this is putting two people through life. But I think uh, as we were making the game, you know, just like a project, journey is, the development of journey is like journey itself. <laughs> the beginning part is all happy and exciting a lot of exploration, a lot of distraction as well. And then it's just like our life, you know, when we were young, we never worry about immortality, right? I mean, we just, our body heals, uh, you know, our endless energy. Yeah. And somewhere during the middle term of our life, we were like, oh, we could have, we could die, right? W what does that mean? And then as you enter 30 to 40, you, you have this kind of midlife crisis, it was like, was that all life is, is about? Was, am I on the track? Like, did the thing I was doing, was the mountain I'm going still the thing I was going, right? So under, in the underground level of journey, mountain is not visible. You know, for a period of time in your life, you always doubt about it. And then, and then you regain hope, you know. And then, you know, before, you know, this is Joseph Campbell's thing, right? If, a story is only worth told to others for thousands of years if the story has two very important elements. Number one is there's always a near-death ordeal. If it's not difficult, why would people even tell the story? Yeah. Right? And number two, after the ordeal, that people who, the hero has to bring something back for the community. You know, you never hear a story about a get bank robber successfully robbing the bank and live a happy life afterward, <laughs> right? Because the society doesn't need that story. The, st the society needs a story where he robbed the bank and gave the money to the poor people. Mm -hmm. And so, so those are the things that has to happen. And we kind of just follow the master's plan uh, to execute journey. Yeah. So uh, the multiplayer of mm -hmm. journey was a was a, an actual genuine and a, a, a literal surprise mm -hmm. to a lot of players you know they didn't realize that those were actual other people was was that something that was difficult to keep a secret before the, before the game <laughs> uh, released? to be honest we didn't keep the secret intentionally we just thought people would know it's a real player because ai is not that advanced yeah and we want it kept the identity as secret as possible, we went all the way out to the extent where, you know, in PlayStation, if you play with somebody, if you just pause the game, you go to look at uh, uh, friends, they will automatically show you who you just played the game with. And we don't want the player to know 
who they would play. And so we even banned that feature <laughs> just for this game. Uh, because I thought, if you know his name is, you know, kill your daddy, it will immediately ruin the mood of the game. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but, I, I, but it, it, yeah, to my surprise, is many people thought that was just an AI. Uh, so, so we had to really remind them that the, they are real people at the very, 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 very end. Right. It worked though, you know, it's because uh, yeah. we're so used to seeing a, a player's, uh, you know, PlayStation name or gamer tag above mm -hmm. their head in the game, and you didn't do that until until the very end in the in the credits, which I thought was great. I, you know, looking at your career and your uh, resume of your your body of work. I would have to think that you're a fan of the the so-called the walking simulator genre because you're 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 uh, yeah. Very I think fond we of, we of made this game before walking simulator was a term. <laughs> yeah. So do you have a favorite one? Do you have a, do you have a or, or even I guess it doesn't even have to be that genre. Just any mm -hmm. game that 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 has maybe emotionally affected you in in recent years since since you started okay. making games. Okay. So so after walking simulator become a term. Gone Home was the game at the time. I played Gone Home. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to pick up the nuances of that particular period because I didn't grow up there. Right, the, yeah, 90s America. Right, and so to me it was just kind of like weird puzzle games, you know, like, but I could intellectually understand why many people liked it. Me personally, I wasn't able to because of the cultural difference. Yeah. And uh, have you played Firewatch? Uh, yes, I played that as well. And guess what? I've never been an Eagle Scout. Uh, you know, <laughs> like I noticed that uh, among Asia, we never had the the the, the tradition of going hiking on right. trails. In Asia, if you go to hike, you hike to a tourist spot, right? I, I noticed here people like to hike to places nobody goes, right? Uh, but it was. Difficult for me to understand as well. Um, I like the, the, the story, the twist, um, but it wasn't a particular life that I'm intrigued about. I, I play the game because it's beautiful. Yes. Yeah, I, I was just really like, I want to see more of this game. It's so beautiful. Uh, yeah, and I also played um, Everybody Went to Rapture. I love that game. Yeah. Yes. And the music's amazing. Yeah, and it's a beautiful, beautiful game. And again, I was not able to a hundred percent sync in because I'm not really familiar with the British right nineteen eighties. Yes. <laughs> I was just like, hmm, okay, right. It's 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 just felt like I was never able to fully <laughs> soak up what the creator wants to say because I was not equipped with the, the knowledge. Um, let me talk about when, when your games get remastered for the PlayStation 4, mm -hmm. what's, the, what's the primary goal of, of that exercise? Is it just a, let's keep the lights on, let's keep the revenue coming in kind of move, or is it, which I'm now suspecting given what you've been saying in this conversation, that it's just a, and the idea of get as many people to see and experience the game as possible? Yeah, I, I think uh, Journey uh, PS4 was not my creation. I was not involved in it at all. It was the publisher who yeah. made Journey at Sony. They thought this was a really important game that they want more people to be uh, exposed to it. And I certainly fully supported the idea, but I was busy working on Sky. Right. And uh, so we were trying to, I mean, we were basically giving feedbacks on the company who ported the game, but I, I give a lot of credits, credits to Sony to actually, you know, uh, Nathan Gary was at the time the creative director of Sony. We kind of worked through a journey together. It's a baby to him as well. And, and uh, so it was mostly Nathan's credits to bring journey to PS4. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Flower came as well. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, so you, you like having the, get your games on on this new platform, especially with how successful the PlayStation Four has been. Uh, yeah, I mean, many people when we made Journey, it's kind of like 
oh, I heard it was a great game, but I don't have a PlayStation. That's the no most common thing. And yeah, and the fact we are on PlayStation 4 now, at least people can experience something. Yeah. It, it's, uh, yeah. Um, has, you've talked about, uh, about stories and art making you cry has and and you even you mentioned earlier that that uh, a game making you cry is not such a, a, a foreign concept anymore. Have, have what what was the last? Have you had a game recently that's 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 made that's brought you emotion or? I cried in Sky not because of the game I made but because someone I played with. Uh, but it's very personal. It's it's not it's not uh, a creation of the creator. It's a, it's a person yeah. who did something for me in the game that really touched me. Uh, yeah, but you know if if it's other game, you know, honestly, I will I will bring up Dark Souls. Really, I played Dark Souls. I, I I didn't cry. But I, I was really moved by it in a very strange way. Uh, you know, Dark Souls is all about you against the world uh, and everything that world is trying to kill you. And while I, was, I spent probably over 160 hours in Dark Souls wow. 2, and I got everything, but I still have this craving to go back. I think sometimes while I was playing the Midnight in that game, there's a strange feeling of loneliness, but also truth of life. I, I think I'm way over reading into that game, but the feeling of life is lonely, and the fact I'm here, I have to survive, you know, is actually very truthful. There's something weird about that game that it made me feel very beautiful. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, the, the later games, you know, like Last of Us, these games makes people feel very strongly. I mean, I played, yeah, last year, my favorite experience was Inside. It's kind of like the what? So good. Yeah, it's the what the fuck. <laughs> yes. You know, but that's what I remembered. Uh, yeah. Yeah, from uh, the, the first season of Telltale's Walking Dead. Yeah, the first that season. story was... Amazing. It's, but for, for Telltale's game, it's weird. It's like it's so strong. I mean, that's also why I stopped watching Walking Dead. It, it was so serious and so emotional that I felt like I can only have one. I don't want to take another right. beat on the heart. <laughs> yeah, it, it was so strong that I actually don't want to go back to it. Uh, but I guess, you know, movie business is big there's people liking different things uh, yeah I, I personally don't like horror games or horror films yeah me neither <laughs> right so for, for me walking that has managed to cross that line that I was really feeling bad yeah that I don't want to play more of that anymore so if your games have a common theme to me it's probably one of non-confrontation uh, maybe relaxation and and probably contemplation mm -hmm. would be what I would say. Has have those things been sort of a, a a conscious theme that you've wanted to express on your part, or or just more of a of a natural expression of who you are? Mm -hmm. I think uh, there was a Euro Euro gamer interview. I think that captured very well. I think I'm a, in a very core. Cool, I'm a hardcore gamer. I'm a super competitive. Yeah, I'm going to get to that in a second, yeah. too. Yeah, and uh, so the game I talked to you about, like, Dark Souls 2, I mean, lately I've been always playing, like, mobile games, you know, and the reason I work on these games is because I think they are the, the most needed games for this industry. And my, my goal is to make more people love the thing I love. You know, I want to make games to be embraced by everyone as... A medium of art. I mean, like if I, I told people, like my goal is when I grad, oh, so not graduate, when I retire, and I told someone, hey, uh, I, I was a game creator. Right now, if you tell people you're a game creator, they don't think you the same way they think you're a writer. They don't think you the same way as a poet. 
They don't think you're the same way as a theater director. They don't think you're the same way as a movie director. They think you as someone who makes things to entertain their kids, sometimes in a bad way. They think you are someone who is making lots of money, you know, by using gambling methods, right? And very rarely, you talk to one who's not a hardcore gamer, that you're a game developer. They will look at you differently. Yeah. And so, yeah, my my entire career has been dedicated to see if I can change that. Uh, one way is to make games that actually adults, you know, would actually appreciate something that could really talk about subject that is more serious. I mean, that's more relatable uh, if you grow older. And the, the, the other thing is to really see if we could push the industry and the market so that it creates an environment where you know, these content can be made. So it's about creating the content, it's about shaping the, the, the industry. That's kind of like my interest. Yeah. Is, uh, has, any, has Sony or any other major publisher ever tried to ever come, come to you and offer to buy that <laughs> game company? Have you ever been tempted? Uh, we talked about that after Journey because you know, we almost kind of you know, bankrupt the company. We laid off most of the staff. Sony is like, yeah, you know, we can, we can, we can buy your company if you want. You know, we, we, we trust your next project now, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm curious, why is that an interesting question? Because the most interesting thing I've heard is Mark Zuckerberg wanted to buy TGC. That was the most interesting huh. thing, but it wasn't related to game or console or anything. <laughs> hmm. uh, but. I don't think that's really a subject we want to go farther on here. You know. Yeah, it, it's always just interesting yeah. to me if, you know, because there's, from the gamer's perspective, it's, there are pluses and minuses to it. You know, mm -hmm. you might get a lot more sort of funding for a project, but at the same time, there, you know, there are a lot of, there, there are developers who have, have uh, five or ten years later ended up gone after, mm -hmm. after an acquisition. So it's always a, it's always a, a strange thing. I think it's always a little scary for gamers if they hear that their one of their favorite developers has been bought by somebody. But it's you know I always like to see to see it from the developer's perspective mm -hmm. as well. It's like well we <laughs> we have employees to take care of and maybe we maybe, you know maybe that we have a good offer. But um, the new game Sky that mm -hmm. is that's why you're here. You're not here for fun. You're here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having fun, but we're here to talk about Sky ultimately, and that is the next project for that mm -hmm. game company and. You revealed it on stage at Apple's most recent iPhone event, which really, all things considered, is, is as big or bigger of a stage than E3, I think is fair to say. Uh, you have last year before you, Shigeru Miyamoto was on stage revealing Super Mario Run. <laughs> yes. um, so after you do that, after you reveal the game on stage there, do you hear a lot from old friends or USC classmates who who may have seen you and yeah, your game you, you, on stage? Yeah, you're very good at predicting. I think <laughs> we got. I got some like high school friend reached out to me uh, that I've, I almost forgot about. You know, like yeah, lots of random people remember me suddenly. <laughs> that they have no interest in game industry at all, right? And yeah, I, I think the Apple event was was kind of a surprise that how little. Uh, it has changed the gaming the gaming co community, but it it's also kind of how wide it has reached out to any of my non game friends. Yeah, like most of my gaming friends, they don't even know the game was announced. Uh, wow. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, a lot of my friends. Oh, I just fast forwarded the whole Apple TV side part. I just kind of watched the end. Look at the iPhone X, you know. <laughs> Uh, it was the, the random people that discovered it that was really surprising. That's interesting. So Sky, to me, seems like kind of a natural evolution of, of everything you've been doing. In fact, you've, you've sort of touched on that as we've gone here. Um, I now think I have a pretty good idea of the answer to this question, but uh, why mobile? Oh, uh, why iPhone? Yeah, because I mentioned my goal is to change people's view on games. And 
given how well Journey was sold on PlayStation, PlayStation as a whole is 70 million console. Yeah. And console industry at its peak, PlayStation 2 was 142 million console. But today we have more than 2 billion people who play games. And most of them are exposed to games that was not that good, right? And uh, s most of these games are somewhat downright malicious. Yeah. And it, it's like, on one end, I'm so happy billions of people are gamers now. But on the other hand, I felt the whole industry, all the effort we've put into bring video game into an artistic medium has just went backwards for at least five to 10 years. Because of mobile games? Yeah, because if you really look at the, the opinion or the percentage of people's view on games, now they look at games as, I mean, majority of people I talk to look at games are now thinking games as just, just another time waster. Right. I'm so glad to hear you say that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't want to make this interview about me, but I, like while we're on this subject, I got to ask you because like I feel like mobile. You know, a lot of kids now they they grow up with mobile games as their mm -hmm. first experience with video games, yeah. and so the trappings and uh, as you say, almost malicious intent mm -hmm. of some of these games becomes the expectation as they grow up and graduate yeah, into yeah. console games it, it and is. PC it's, games. It's happening. And, and we're seeing with the, this loot box craze yeah. now. Do you think mobile games, by, by and large, are, are ruining gaming or having a detrimental effect on it gaming? It has definitely created... I mean, the funny thing is, okay, I could go into a lot more ranting, but I would just say, if you go to see a doctor and the doctor doesn't cure your disease and he extends your disease to make it worse so you have to keep buying medicine from him, you would put him in jail, <laughs> right? Yes. If you go to a game designer, well, his job is to create entertainment that benefits you. Instead, he doesn't give you fun. He gives you frustration. He strangles you frustrated by something until you give him money. Shouldn't you put these people in jail? Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and the fact this is now the norm is just infuriating, you know? And, uh, but, you know, we're playing a game where whatever makes money, you know, people follow. Right. And so, yeah, I, I'm trying to create a situation where a well-made game, a game that cares about the player, respects the player, could still generate good revenue. So then you can create a path for other publishers or investors to, you know, consider doing it the honest way, doing it the honorable way. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, if you really look at most of the games that makes you pay on the mobile phone, they take advantage of your weakness, right? And, and this is not just a gaming, this is everywhere, you know, buy one, get one free. Lim for limited time, if you don't buy it, you will lose this opportunity to get a discount. What is that? Fear of missing out? Greed? Hmm. You know, and it, it is everywhere in this world. I mean, th these are typical marketing schemes they do in JCPenney, they do it in retail shops, it's all in the games right now. Yeah. So, I mean, anybody watching this interview should know you and and your history but just for just to hear it from you what what is sky all about i mean we we know it's on on phones but to me it seems like from what i've seen of it on on apple stage and and what uh, i've seen of it from from you uh it almost seems like the ultimate expression of 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 some of journey's ideas particularly on the the multiplayer <laughs> uh side of things so uh, what what is sky from from your words uh, when people ask me what is journey I actually intentionally to not describe it because <laughs> if I say it's allegory of life they would think I'm bullshitting uh, well I said that <laughs> yeah yeah and, I said it's an allegory for life yeah I, I would rather leave the players to interpret what it is because whatever I say will always fail on some people yeah uh, 
but if there's anything, I think a lot of people who play Journey or Flower, their number one feedback besides the game itself is, I wish I could have played this with the, my family. You know, people would say, this is the first game my wife played and finished. Uh, could I play Journey with my wife together? But I only have one PlayStation. Yeah. Right, and uh, you know, so many people find the experience of Journey was almost kind of therapeutic that I felt like I want to show the world that this is what games can do. Um, and I wanted them to experience that with, with the people they, they, they truly care about, right? And so the way to allow you to play with your daughter or your wife is to put it on a device that you and your daughter or wife all own and they are connected and you can experience this together. Uh, so yeah, in a way I, I think I want to, <laughs> uh, I mean as far as what we've made so far, we've been focusing on the positive side of the humanity. Uh, you know, I think there's plenty of games talk about the brutality, the, the, the violence about humanity. I want to show something beautiful between the players. I mean, that's what really Journey is about. Uh, and I hope that you can experience this with, with the people you love, and particularly the people who disrespect games. Hmm. So, so that's, that's what I hope. But I, I also think this is the first time I'm working on a game that is not finished. Yeah. Like Journey is a finished product. There's nothing more I want to add to it. Well, Sky is an ongoing game, you know. Uh, and I also really worry because many people will think this is not as polished, you know, as a finished game. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think many people will be surprised how this game makes money. Uh, and this is something I have, I think like, like my biggest breakthrough or innovation on this game is about <laughs> how it actually charges people. Hmm. Uh, yeah, this is something you probably have never seen before. Once you play the game, you will, you, you will be interested because it's a game where you pay money for other people, not yourself. Interesting. Uh, I, don't, I don't suppose you want to elaborate on that for me. Not yet. Yeah, yeah not yet. Um, <laughs> All right. Well, that's, I mean, yeah, that is, you have my attention for mm -hmm. sure. Um, you, you touched on this earlier, but, you know, your games are about positivity and, and non-competition, but you mentioned earlier that as a gamer, you, you love competitive games. Mm -hmm. Street Fighter, you mentioned Dark Souls, which isn't multiplayer, but it's very competitive. Mm -hmm. uh, Starcraft, uh, you touched on that. You mentioned that. So that that's a, I find that to be a fascinating contrast between you, your personal preferences, and your your artistic uh, goals. Yeah, but uh, as I mentioned, if you are really competitive, even as a professional game developers, you are looking for how to maximize your contribution to the industry, and. Uh, if I try to make another fighting game, I will, I will fail, you know, because fighting games requires a lot of experience and knowledge and taste, and I know I'm not good at it. Uh, if I want to make a American football game, I will definitely fail. I don't even know the rule of football, <laughs> right? So the only kind of game that I could excel at, you know, I think there's one thing people say is like, you were only born to do one thing, you know, everyone has their own legend, legend. And so what am I good at? What yeah. am I supposed to do is determined by, you know, my background and what the world needs at this moment. What, uh, do you have any game designers that you admire? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think this is kind of lame. Everybody loves Fumito Ueda. Right, the Shadow of Colossus and the Last Guardians and Eco. Yeah. Every time I saw his game, I was like, this was done on a PlayStation 2? <laughs> it makes me want to just crawl into the ground because 
stuff I make even right now is nowhere near to the quality that they were able to pull off. I mean, I, when I was working on a journey, I look at Mario 64, I was like, oh my God, these people have figured everything out 15 years before I even like try to tackle this. It makes me just feel, yeah, it, it, it's just, there's so many things I'm not good at that I have to avoid directly competing with them. Um, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, uh, yeah. I, Will Wright sounds like he was on that list and you just, yeah, you, you didn't Will get Wright, to learn enough yes, from him that, as right. much as you'd hoped. Yeah, and uh, honestly, game designer, game creator wise, I think there are many people who are way more talented than me. And uh, it, it's kind of like, I wish I can have all their abilities, you know, <laughs> like to put in my own game, but yeah. Well, let me leave you uh, with a last, last question here. I'm just mm -hmm. kind of curious. You are one of the most prominent and certainly uh, decorated and certainly successful independent game developers. Mm -hmm. So. How do you feel about the state of independent gaming today? Because certainly a lot has changed in that space since that game company was founded. Yeah, I feel old. <laughs> uh, when we first entered the industry, I remember you can count on you can count all the indie gamers with two hands. I mean, indie game developers. Right. I mean, Jonathan Blow with Braid. You know, uh, at the time there was Play Dead. Play that with Limbo, you know, it's like you can count everybody and we know everybody. It's a very small community. We're very tightly knit because it's us against the big boys. Yeah. Um, but it was, you know, TGC is only out there for like 12 years. Like over these 12 years, suddenly I don't know anybody anymore. Mm. <laughs> uh, and when, I mean, back then with indie, we also have this feeling like we don't have the equal opportunity to have our voice heard because publisher won't even publish your game right. most of the time. But today, everybody have the direct access to app stores or Steams that it's almost difficult to say what is indie anymore because there's so many people who is just making a Minecraft clone, mm -hmm. you know, is that indie, right? Like, what is indie? <laughs> and I remember back then, indie was like us against the, the big, bad, bad, you know, triple A big boys. Yeah. It's, we are like pirates, you know, <laughs> we are trying something unorthodox, financially unproven. You know, we're trying things just because we like it, you know, and we're doing all these, I think it's romantic. It's very romantic to do indie games because we are rock and roll. We're, we're rock and roll basically. Yes. But right now, if you want to say indie developer, every single app developer in the garage is indie developer. But who is rock and rolling? It's hard <laughs> to find them now. It's I couldn't put them into faces because they're everywhere. Hmm. Uh, I don't even get to see what Toby Fox look like, right? It's, it's kind of like the internet era now yeah. where everything is distributed. But it's good though, right? Yeah. With all these tool sets being so yeah. accessible to almost anyone. I mean, it Unre is Unreal good. Engine is like free with a with a back end cut that goes to Epic and right. uh, all these different. It is definitely Unity good. I'm just ranting as an old man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like I thought I understand this space. I'm, I actually have lost touch of it. <laughs> well, uh, I, we look very much forward to Sky uh, coming soon for the iPhone. Can you play it on iPad too? You. I mean, okay, you can play on any platform. Any I mean, connected, any connected. Yeah, and we, we launch on the Apple platform first, but we always have plans for other platforms. Excellent. Yeah. All right, so Sky coming soon, debuting on Apple platforms. Uh, Genova Chen from that game company. 
Gosh, thank you so much. This was, this was a real treat. I had a blast learning about your career. Uh, thank it's you. It's fascinating to me. Thank you so much. For more from the best, brightest, and uh, most fascinating minds in the games industry, stay tuned for new episodes of IGN Unfiltered every month right here on IGN.